Hey, Pete. Hey, Nick. How you doing today? Great. I'm excited to learn about modal analysis with you. Wonderful. Yeah, it should be a it should be a good session here. What a what a fun topic to talk about. So, um, thank you to to everyone who's joined us today. We're going to discuss modal analysis. Um, we've got a quick agenda here, so we'll give you a, a brief introduction, maybe as to some reasons why we might be interested in performing a modal analysis. And then we'll go through some topics like natural frequencies, frequency response functions, how one might perform an impact test, as well as discussing things like uh, the modal assurance criterion and modal curve fitting. So how do we take some data and from that data derive the modes um, of our system. So, Pete, are you ready to go? Yeah, that's a lot to cover all in one day. Or one hour. Have to talk Sorry. Pretty Wait, fast. It's not even one day. <laughs> well, without further ado, let's get going. Oh, is this an example of modal? I'd hate to be in that plane. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely got some mode shapes going in the wings. I think this is a aero acoustic flutter test, Nick. If you get going okay. fast enough, you excite the modes of the wings, the damping goes to zero, and they fall off. Oh, okay. So not really a plane that you would want to uh, ride in, huh? Yeah. Although in the aerospace industry, they don't call it a modal test. They test for this on the ground initially before they fly. They call it a ground vibration test to determine the modes. And then they can okay. go in the air and see how fast and far they can fly. Okay, well, I'm glad they're testing for this before they let uh, you and me hop on the airplane. Yeah, it's an FAA requirement. Oh, that's a classic. Uh, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge got a little mode going. Uh, although I think there was, uh, if you look at this mode shape, there's a nodal line where it doesn't move down the center. I think some guy okay. was able to walk out here to try and rescue a dog in that car. Uh, oh. but the dog didn't want to come and yeah, well, this is quite tragic. I, I'm already one minute into the presentation that could have crying. <laughs> this, uh, presentation has drama. Yeah. Tragedy. It's got it all. And mode shapes like the Tacoma and narrow mode bridge modes of vibration there. Yeah. Oh, I, this is, uh, probably near and dear to your heart, Pete, huh? Yeah. You know, and. Michigan, where I live, uh, you know, in the winter, we don't have much to do. But I, I you know, occasionally I see modes in everyday life, like this uh, streetlight sign that uh, was waving above uh, intersection. So yeah, modes are everywhere, and I guess they're quite often destructive. I wouldn't be surprised if that thing fell eventually. So yeah, or if maybe there's a red light camera on there or something like that. Maybe some people are rooting for that thing to fail. Yeah. Little speeding tickets. No. <laughs> so those were all some good examples of of where we might need to use or, or wish we had used modal analysis um, in the real world. And now we're going to go through some of kind of the basics or kind of the backbone of um, modal analysis and modal testing. So some things we really need to understand before we proceed any further. So we'll talk about things like what is a natural frequency, damping, mode shapes, and what is resonance. So we'll start off with natural frequencies. So on this slide I've got a nice simple mass spring damper system. So I've got my little mass here M. It's connected to the ground by a spring K and a damper C. Now, if, Pete, if you were to, to put your finger on top of this mass and depress it downwards and release it, the mass would vibrate or oscillate back and forth at its natural frequency. So a natural frequency is the frequency at which a system is naturally going to vibrate once we've forced it into motion. And that natural frequency, the frequency that it'll vibrate at, is the square root of the stiffness of the system divided by the mass. Cool. So all the objects around us have natural frequencies, just like this mass spring system? Is that? Yeah. 
Yeah, but they yeah exactly. Th- this has a single mass and spring, I guess, because objects are like a distributed mass and spring. They actually end up with multiple natural frequencies. That's correct. So yes, you know something like, you know, your toaster or your car. Yeah, you know, or or any other you know object around you in the real world will have multiple natural frequencies. So multiple frequencies that it'll tend to vibrate at if we force that system. And it's all dependent on the mass and stiffness of the object. Got it. Okay. So oh, that's... a nice little cat video here. Yeah, that's close to the frequency of a or single system natural frequency. That's not bad. This cat's a real uh, physicist here. Yeah, he's uh, pulling on it to check if it goes into a natural frequency. I think if, if you listen to that recording, you know what it is. So now let's talk about resonance. Resonance is the buildup of large amplitude oscillations that occurs when a structure is excited at its natural frequency. So in this animation that we've got here, we've got our mass spring damper system, and we start by exciting it below the resonant frequency, and we don't see too much motion or oscillation in the system. We then start oscillating it, or um, uh, providing a, an input force that is at the resonant frequency of the structure. And we see the oscillations greatly increase in magnitude right there. And then once we move past the resonance, when we excite it at a frequency above the natural frequency, the oscillations um, are again lower in amplitude. So if we are to, I guess, excite a structure at its natural frequency, even if we're not putting that much force into the system, we can see really large oscillations or vibrations. Um, so Pete, you know, if we're going to design a structure, we want to we want to make sure that any of the forces going into that structure aren't exciting it at the structure's natural frequency. Oh, so if you have a natural frequency at 40 hertz, you may not want to have a forcing frequency or force input that has 40 hertz. Yep, exactly. If we were to do that, we might uh, be into either see an elevated level of noise or, or vibration or, in you know, the worst case, uh, some sort of catastrophic failure. Be in Tacoma Narrows Bridge territory or something like that. Exactly. So damping is any effect that tends to reduce the oscillations in a, in a system. So... Um, in all of those mass spring damper systems, we were showing this little dash pot. And what that does is if we were to look at these two systems here, one just a mass spring system and then one a mass spring system with a damper, if we were to set both of those systems in motion, the one on the left has no damping and therefore will vibrate or oscillate indefinitely. There's a uh, no way to reduce the energy in that system, and so it continues oscillating. That damper on the right-hand side is reducing the oscillations in the system, so that energy um, is being dissipated through, um, you know, methods like friction or interactions like friction, um, and it actually dampens out the vibrations of that system. Mm. And C is the letter for damping, and that red dash pot there is the damper, huh? Yep, exactly. All right. And the damping ratio of the system is equal to that damping coefficient C, which is uh, a material property, divided by 2 times the square root of K times M. So the damping of the system actually depends on this coefficient C and the stiffness and the mass of the system. So now we'll talk a little bit about frequency response functions. Uh, a frequency response function is a measurement where we measure the system's output in response to a known input signal. 
And this frequency response function gives us uh, clues as to uh, kind of the dynamics of our system, how our system will uh, perform or respond to real world forces. So on the left hand side there I've got a little impulse force, we'll show that to you right here, where I'm maybe tapping my structure, putting in a, an impulse into the system, and then on the right hand side I measure that response with something like a accelerometer. And so I've got a impulse as an input, I measure the response with my accelerometer, and then the frequency response function is the output divided by the input. And it characterizes the system itself, right? It's kind of independent of the force in, in the long run. Yep, exactly. Okay. Because we're doing that division, <clears throat> Um, we're trying to basically understand um, exactly kind of how our structure is behaving uh, at multiple different frequencies. So kind of normalizing that response by the input force. And if we were to look, if we look instead in the frequency domain, so here you can see the x-axis is now in hertz instead of um, in seconds, an impact in the uh, frequency domain is a kind of uh, broad band excitation, so we're relatively equally exciting a large number of frequencies. And so when we provide this impact into our system, we're accelerating or uh, exciting all of these frequencies relatively equally. And so by looking then at our frequency response function, we can examine what frequencies in our structure are responding very strongly and we can use this to determine the natural frequencies of the system. So something very brief in the time domain that impact is broad in the frequency domain They excite all these frequencies the same. same yep. Idea. Okay. Yeah exactly if we were to take a quick look you know we've got some time domain signals on the left hand side and their uh, frequency domain equivalents on the right hand side and if we look at the very bottom here, our impulse in the time domain is short in the time domain and long in the frequency domain. So it's this nice broadband excitation. So these frequency response functions give us a lot of useful information about the dynamic properties of our structure. And so I'll give you a little quiz, Pete. What, uh, what do you think a frequency response function can tell us about our structure? Well, I guess those peaks there are the natural frequencies, right? Yep. And looks like there's so, maybe about five of them or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess if you were smart, uh, the width of those peaks tell you something about the damping. The more lightly damped, the sharper they are. The wider, the more heavily damped. And then I, I guess if you use that phase information on the bottom, you can kind of get an idea if your product is twisting or uh, bending or, you know, some some idea. Yeah, exactly. So we'll, we'll cover kind of all of these pieces in the next couple of slides. Um, but, you know, frequency response functions can give us information not only about, you know, what... Uh, what are the natural frequencies of our structure, but the damping of those natural frequencies and the way that the structure will move os or, or oscillate at those um, natural frequencies, so the mode shapes of the system. So the, uh, like you mentioned, those peaks in the frequency response function can tell us something about the damping at that particular natural frequency and one thing that we can do is if we look at one of our peaks here, so in green here I have a peak in the frequency response function, we can calculate the damping of this peak by using something called the uh, half power method, where if we look at the, the actual um, peak here, this maximum value of the peak in the frequency response function, and then we write down what frequency that peak occurs at. 
if we then go 3 dB down and look at where the frequency response function intersects this horizontal line 3 dB down and note those frequencies F1 and F2 this damping factor or, or sometimes it's also called the quality factor is an uh, indicator of the damping of the system and it's equal to F0 divided by F2 minus F1. And this is, you know, basically like you said earlier, Pete, a uh, kind of a, a calculation of the damping of the, of the free, uh, natural frequency based on um, the width of the peak and the frequency response function. And there are uh, many different ways to express damping. So, um, for example, you may have heard of the loss factor before, or, uh, maybe more commonly the damping ratio. And it's possible to convert this quality factor to these other forms of damping. So, for example, the loss factor is equal to 1 over Q which is equal to two times zeta, the damping ratio, and so on. I have a theory that you have all these forms just to make it make differences sound a bit bigger, like percent critical. Oh, that changed from 1% to 2%. That's, you know, sounds like a small change, but oh, the loss factor went from 100 to 200. Sounds much bigger, even though like it's like the same thing mathematically or something. Mm -hmm. Probably don't have my math quite right. But. It's all a conspiracy theory to to make the problem sound worse than it is, huh? Or to make your damping material sound like it's made a big change, which you know mm. maybe those numbers are a big change. Well, if we were uh, you know also to look at this, we could look at two different peaks. Um, so two different peaks in the frequency response function and, and something maybe a little funny about that damping factor or quality factor is that a low factor Q equals 2 corresponds to a heavily damped peak where something that's a, a higher number like Q equals 10 corresponds to a lightly damped peak. Oh, so you have to so make it higher, sound... Yeah, you have to make it sound, do the opposite of what people are expecting just to keep them on their toes. Yes, yeah, exactly. It's, that's why we're all engineers, just to keep people on their toes. Okay. And so um, damping can be calculated uh, within a SimCenter test lab active picture. So if you have a, a frequency response function in an active picture, like I have here, we can actually put some cursors on these peaks and then use those cursors to calculate the damping of each of these peaks. So I'll go ahead and show that right now. I'll go ahead and activate this test lab active picture. And when I double click on it, I can do some pretty neat things. Like if I wanted to zoom in on a particular area, I could do so. I could change the limits or the format of the picture, and I can do things like adding in cursors. So I'll add a cursor to my display, and then I'll go ahead and I'll maybe put it at this first peak in my frequency response function. And if I want to calculate the um, damping of this peak, I can right click on the cursor, go to calculations, and calculate something like Q, Zeta, or Eta. And I get the damping of my nice. peak here. Yeah, so I could, you know, maybe calculate Q as well. And does that active picture that takes a license? It is not. It's a free plugin, so it's available to anyone. I mean, uh, the organization who who wants access to it there's just a, a plugin that needs to be downloaded on the uh, Siemens community site website cool so the last thing that we've mentioned is that a frequency response function can give us an idea of the mode shapes of our system or the the kind of the pattern of vibration when the structure is excited at its natural frequency 
So I can use information here in the frequency response function. If I were to look at multiple frequency response functions, and I could plot that information, and I would be able to see, ah, so this first peak here looks like it corresponds to some sort of twisting mode. And then maybe the second one corresponds to a bending mode, and the third one might be second twisting, for example. And we could do that by looking at the imaginary portion or the phase of the frequency response function. And we'll go into a little more detail on that. So I should explain a little bit uh, more about mode shapes. A mode shape is the kind of natural pattern of oscillation or vibration when a system is excited at its natural frequency or one of its natural frequencies. So if I were to look at this simple string, it's fixed at the left end and the right end. If I were to excite that string at its natural frequency, its first natural frequency, I would get this pattern of oscillation or vibration. If I were to excite the string at its second natural frequency, I would see this sort of shape here where I now have these two areas of maximum displacement. And if I were to excite the string again at its third natural frequency, I would get this representative pattern of vibration. So now I have these three peaks here and these two areas where I have zero displacement. So that's kind of how we get a note and its harmonics out of the same string? Um, I'm, you know, not a musician, Pete, so you'd have to tell me. I'm going to guess yes. But... <laughs> but so as we go higher in frequency, you can see that these shapes tend to get a little more complex. So starting at the first mode here, I only have one point where I've got kind of this maximum displacement. The second mode has two points where I have a, a maximum in the displacement, and then the third mode has these three points and so on. So the higher we go in frequency, the more complex the shape typically, huh? Yeah, kind of a rule of thumb. And so a little more terminology, these points of maximum displacement in the mode shape are called antinodes, and these places of minimum displacement in the mode shape are called nodes. And this will be uh, very important later when we talk about, you know, locations where we want to excite our structure. Or even where we want uh, to measure, huh? Yep, yep. I imagine if we measured only on the black, we'd be like, hey, there's no mode shape. Yeah, you would see no displacement at all. But even, I guess, uh, for, you know, design considerations, if we knew that um, we were going to be operating near the third mode of our structure, uh, we might want to, you know, place a critical component, maybe some electronics, at a node of our structure instead of something like this anti-node. Yeah. Is that... Yeah, because it makes sense it, just to. It would shake the heck out of the electronics, huh? Yeah, exactly, if it was placed at an anti node of the system. So uh, we can look at, you know, maybe a couple of more interesting mode shapes. So we've got a few mode shapes of a break disc here. So instead of looking at these kind of simple string systems, um, what would you uh, call this mode, Pete? I don't know. It reminds me of that game I played when I was a kid with paper, where you like, you are not it, and you fold the paper up, but some sort of bending or something. Yeah. The center out of phase. Maybe a nice little seesaw mode if you wanted to get creative with these two points being out of phase of each other. Ooh. What about something like this? Ooh, center pumping. Yeah. Hooping. Hooping, yeah, I like that. Name. Top hat, top hat uh, mode. You can become uh, truly creative trying to describe the way these shapes look. Okay, so frequency response functions are uh, are complex functions, 
which means that there is a real component and an imaginary component in the frequency response function, which uh, is important because these different components of the FRF, the real component and the imaginary component, can give us or uh, allow us to, to see different important uh, information about our structure. For completeness here, um, I've got some equations showing how if I have my real component and my imaginary component, I can change that from, from real and imaginary to amplitude by taking the square root of the imaginary component squared plus the real component squared and phase, where the phase is just the inverse tangent of the imaginary component and the real component. So uh, there's different formats we can view these frequency response functions in, real and imaginary, or amplitude and phase. And I can do that again in a active picture. So I could if I wanted to activate this picture by double clicking on it, I'm viewing this frequency response function in amplitude and phase. I could right click on that y axis and change that to imaginary and real. So, do you often look at imaginary FRFs, Nick? Pete, I would say I don't do so very often, but. Is there a benefit? Well, there sure is. Um, if we were to look at the imaginary portion of a frequency response function and the actual mode shape of a structure, we can see that the, uh, by plotting the, the amplitude and direction of the imaginary portion of a frequency response function, we can actually view the mode shape oh. at that frequency. So yeah. let's, let's take a look at this. On the left hand side here I've got six frequency response functions and I'm viewing the imaginary portion of those frequency response functions. And the colors of the frequency response functions correspond to the, uh, the points on my plate here. So for example this green point corresponds to this green frequency response function, this teal point corresponds to this teal point on the plate, and so on. So if I were to look at these frequency response functions, I can see that for my green curve, I've got a large positive peak at 532 points. And then if I were to look at the red FRF, I can see I have a uh, I'd say a, a somewhat large negative peak at 532 points. Uh, did I say points there, Pete? I meant hertz. And so if I were to animate that imaginary portion, I can see that my green point and my red point are out of phase from each other. Yeah, just like the imaginary of the FRF. But... Yep, exactly. Okay. If I were to look at these two points that aren't moving very much at all, my purple point and my blue point, I can see that the amplitude or the the um, they're not moving at all. There. portion yeah. of that, yep, FRF is not moving at all. It is a value of zero. And then likewise, if I were to look at the teal point and the brown point, I can see again that they are. Uh, opposite of each other. So one is a large positive value and the other is a large negative value. So by plotting the imaginary portion of my frequency response function, I can see the mode shape at that frequency. Yeah. And, and if we had the green and the brown, plate 3 and 15, in amplitude and phase, why, or maybe green and red, sorry. If we had green and red, plate one and plate three in amplitude and phase, basically we'd have to have two pieces of information. We'd see the amplitude is the same, and we'd have to look at the phase to see that they're moving opposite directions. Yep, exactly. Okay. So the, the that imaginary portion is kind of giving us both pieces of information at once. Yeah, that's nice.
the whole modal analysis process starts with um, putting some instrumentation on our structure. So in this case, we've got a vehicle where we put maybe some accelerometers on that vehicle. Those are the little gray things? Yep, the little gray things right here. And those are wires, not steam coming out of them or something. So. <laughs> We've yes, got to talk correct. to our Siemens graphics artists. <laughs> and so we put some known input force into our structure, and we measure the response to measure our frequency response functions. Oh, yeah. You remember those? Yep. And I know what we can get from a frequency response function. Uh, and I guess we can get it by curve fitting. Yep. Or Exactly. Which we'll also so cover we'll, later, huh? Yep, yep. We'll talk about modal curve fitting in a, in a little more detail. But, you know, for right now, we basically will extract the natural frequencies, dampings, and, and mode shapes from our structure using curve fitting. Yeah. And then, yeah, voila. From there, from our measured information, we're able to get the modal parameters that we're after. Cool. So, Pete, uh, do you want to show us kind of in practice how that data acquisition portion of this all works? Yeah, I have a little modal impact set up here. I'm going to I'm going to take my uh, camera here and uh, position it where you can see it. All right, Nick, can you uh, see my screen? I can see your screen. Cool. I got impact testing fired up here from Test Lab. And okay. uh, I'm going to just start it with the default uh, settings, and we'll start from scratch here. I okay. have my PC hooked up to a Scatus XS that you see here. And I got a accelerometer, and I got a hammer. They're uh, channel 1 and channel 2, respectively, here. And we got a test object, the finest plexi plate in the land. And it's mm. resting very so on some very soft uh, foam material a carton-like material so that uh, it suspends kind of freely. Cool, huh? Shall I determine the natural frequencies of this sucker? Yeah, let's go ahead and let's figure out some of the, the dynamic properties of that plate. Yeah, so I'm in impact testing, and I'm going to just skip ahead here to channel setup. I need each row here corresponds to one channel on the Scatus XS. And uh, as I said, I have the first two channels, which were on by default, uh, hooked up. The first and the two channels I need, Nick, are what types of? So we need some sort of input channel. We need to excite the structure. And that would be a force, right? Yep. And then, and I... then we would need some sort of response channel. So we need to measure what our structure does when we input that force. And so that's the acceleration. And we know that the force is the input because it's marked as reference here. OK, OK. And in our, our impact hammer there is going to measure the input force. Yeah. And we'll measure that response, that acceleration with our accelerometer. Yeah. And I'm going to power them from the XS itself by setting them to ICP here so they, they get plenty of power. And I'm going to be hitting at uh, one corner um, on the plate. So I'll put plate here. Uh, I believe that's, you know, I'm guessing in advance what the location would be. And then I need to put a, do I need a direction? You know, I think that would be helpful if we're going to, you know, try and animate this plate later. We need to know whether or not it's moving in the X, Y, yeah. Z direction. Like if it's moving laterally, fore, aft, up and down. Yeah. So I got, we I guess you use a right-hand rule. I got my hand here. If this was kind of the origin, so to speak, you know, this would be the X direction, Y direction, Z direction would be straight up and down. So the hammer, I guess, will be hitting downward. So I'll put minus Z, and the accelerometer will measure in the plus Z. Normally, you might calibrate, use an external calibrator, or enter the values. Don't do what we're doing here in this uh, demonstration for a brief. We're trying to do a brief demonstration, but uh, we're just going to ignore that for now. And uh, I'll go over here to impact setup. 
And in impact setup, it kind of takes you through setting up an impact test. The first thing is to do a trigger. So I'll hit start scope here and I'll take a few hits. While they're still up on the screen, I'm going to hit stop scope. And then I can hit this apply suggested. The computer has looked at my hits and it comes up with a suggested trigger level. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, so it's it's basically uh, on the based on the amplitude of your impacts, it's saying uh, start the measurement when I when I reach a certain certain value. Yeah, although if you started, you'd miss the full impact. So it actually does a little bit of time travel, Nick. You see this pre-trigger? Yep. It backs up in time. It has a buffer continuously running, and at 0 .002, it picks up just before the hit starts. So that's okay. pretty cool. Huh? So that allows you to capture, I guess, both trigger on the impact and capture the entire impact in your measurement. Yep. Okay. And so now that I have my triggers set up, I can go to measure here and uh, let's try taking a measurement, shall we? See what yeah. we see. So I'll hit uh, start here. Got some good sounds. Hit it. And let's see what we got here, Nick. So I got, uh, this is the current, or the last FRF we measured. This is the averaged FRF. Mm. Up here was the input force and the accelerometer response. You can see it decays. Okay. And down here is a curious little graph called the coherence, which tells you how repeatable the hits were. If it's very repeatable, the coherence is a value of one. So I've... Um, what do you think of my coherence, Nick? It doesn't look great, Pete. Yeah, it should be one, but it's closer to zero or non-repeatable or halfway. That's a bit unusual. I don't know if you noticed. You'd have to like look at the recording here. But when I was hitting, I didn't really pay attention too carefully. I was busy looking at the screen, and this could happen to you. I wasn't applying the force the same at the same time point and I messed up I think so okay so when you're doing an impact test you should make sure that you're applying the force at the same location and as, at each impact yeah you know um and if you give me a chance Nick maybe I can redeem myself I put the coherence there in the back and I'm going to try and do better okay yeah no it's Let's right. see this. All right. I'm going to focus, Pete. Focus. What I do, Nick? That looks much better. So the coherence is, it looks like it's one for almost the entirety of our frequency range. Yeah. Although it's not unusual for you to have a dip where the FRF has a dip. And these aren't quite lined up, but it's the same frequency. This is... 1800 or so, 1810. Okay. So because that amplitude of the response of the structure is so low, then you could get some noise from the instrumentation. Mm, okay. So, so since the structure isn't really responding at all, we're, we're kind of measuring noise at yeah. that spot. And this would be an anti-resonance, which I guess would be at a node of the structure where it doesn't move too much. Potentially. But yeah, I can see my uh, peaks here that correspond to resonances. Uh, that time I had a decent coherence. I, th You know what, though? I think I can do better. Let me... Oh, what do you think? Does that even deviate from one, or is it just one oh, all the way across? One the all the way range? across. Wow! I am the champion. I I have a sneaking feeling, Pete, that that you're cheating a little bit here. Oh, because I only did one measurement. It was much faster than doing three, Nick. <laughs> but yeah, it's probably not a good idea because coherence is the measure, a measure of the repeatability. 
ultimately the measure of the repeatability of the input and output relationship. Uh, and if you only take one hit, it has no gauge for the repeatability. It is one. So in your companies, don't think the best procedure is to take only one hit. You need to take several hits in order to get a, a good coherence. Okay. Or meaningful coherence, I should say. Um, if you're not careful like I was, you'll get a bad coherence, but at least it alerts you that your measurement maybe isn't that repeatable. All right. Um, you know what? It might be interesting to try and see a mode shape of this plate. To do that, I could build a little geometry. So I'll go to Tools Add-ins here, and I'll turn on Geometry. If you have Test Lab tokens, it just occupies a few tokens. And that was a plate, right? I need to hit accept table before I go to that screen. Go to nodes here. And, you know, I got six orange dots here. So maybe I'll put six points on. And uh, I want to describe those points just the right way. I'm going to do that. Let's see what how I did here. I can say uh, fit model here and turn on the uh, nodes. What do you think? Is that a good yeah, one? I think that looks like a plate. Yeah. And then a real fun thing here is I can go to lines, Nick. And in the lines, I can grab and drag and connect the dots, just like when I was a, a kid. Whoever thought that connecting the dots would be a useful skill for doing modal. All right. We're you're training our children early. Yeah. For and model analysis. All of them across the world with those coloring books. <laughs> and I can go to animation here and try and get an idea of what this looks like. So we got a little uh, screen here. I can line up on a peak and hit play. And I can see here it is plate one. And it's moving up and down. Okay. And, uh, you know, at, at this uh, particular frequency. Now, if I wanted to kind of get an idea of how it's moving in general, all right, I can go back to measure here. And uh, there's this little thing called geometry feedback. What do you think of this, Nick? Well, that looks pretty neat. So it, it's showing our plate here. I see the, the six points that you had defined previously and a, a little impact hammer there yeah and it's also showing me where my uh where the accelerometer is located so here it's on plate one and maybe i want to go to another like plate three here for example so i could hit this increments go to plate three and then physically move the accelerometer and then uh i guess i could take a measurement Okay. Another fine congratulations. And I go back to animation here. And I hit refresh and I got both of the measurements showing. And I'll hit play and now I can see at a given frequency how these two points behave relative to each other. So there's potentially a twist mode, Nick. Okay. All right, Nick, rather than take the rest of these points for you, I already have a project with all six locations measured. So I'm gonna go up here and open. And we can take a look at those uh, mode shapes. Sound like fun? Yeah, it sounds great. All right, so if I go to the navigator here, I'll open uh, a geometry display and uh, I'll drag in our geometry. And again, it's got six points that we've uh, measured. So I'll turn those on. Can you read those or should I make them a little bigger for you? Yeah, let's make them a little bigger. Why not? All right, there you go. That's, that's more, uh, more how, how I can handle it too. So uh, we'll come here and let's look at that first mode. 
Maybe I'll slow it down just slightly here. What do you think of our first mode at a 130 hertz or so? It looks like we've got, you know, some sort of maybe twisting mode. Yeah. All right. Let, of this plate. Let's look at the next one. Double twisting. Oh, okay. Yeah. Second twisting. Hmm. hmm. I wouldn't really expect that. Yeah. Yeah, that looks like a rigid body mode. And I, I know if you, in simulation, if you build a FE model of, for modes uh, that floats freely in space, you'll have six rigid body modes all at zero hertz. You'll have uh, translation in the X, Y, and Z directions. You'll have rotation about each of those axes. Um, but they're usually at zero hertz. And we had this on soft foam, our plate, which simulated free free conditions. And this is actually 385 hertz. It's much higher than some of the first flexible modes. That's weird. Wow. About this one. It's like a, a nice little seesaw mode there. But it's rigid again. So it's the yeah. rotational mode. Oh, this is weird. Now we got first torsion. Which I thought we already saw. Yeah. Huh. Now first bending. Oh my gosh. And another rigid body mode. This is very, very bizarre, Nick. What, why is it, you think, that we have such strange mode shapes? Huh. You know, I, you know did he screw something up somewhere, Pete? Uh, what do you do? How do you calculate these modes? Yeah, we well, look at the imaginary portion of the FRF at each of those locations. I'm pretty sure these mode shapes are correct, but I have a feeling it has something to do with maybe not measuring at enough points to capture the mode shape fully. Again, all these mm. things that, you know, we do this nice interpolation between the measured points. There's only six. Even put in a something that looks like a solid surface, you'd think... That maybe, but we didn't actually measure there. And uh, maybe you could tell us about a tool, like the modal assurance criterion, that can tell us if we've measured at enough points. Would you be willing to do that? Yeah. All right. Sure, absolutely. So let me share my screen here. So the modal assurance criterion is a tool that we can use to... Um, gauge the quality of the mode shapes that we've calculated. It's one of the quality indicators that we can use. And it's Mac for short? Yep, Mac for short. Is that like Big Mac? I think I'm getting hungry. <laughs> so the general idea behind the modal assurance criterion is it's a, a way of describing how similar two mode shapes are. So for a given mode pair, we're comparing two modes we look and see how those shapes are moving and we rank them uh, in similarity using a scale of zero to one or zero percent to a hundred percent. Oh, so the Mr. Cotter, are... Mr. Cotter. That's an old TV series. I'm going to mm. guess one or a hundred percent is very similar and zero is not similar at all. Is that? Exactly. Okay. And so... If we look at this diagram that I've got here, this is an example of a MAC diagram or a MAC matrix. I've got a set of test modes on the left-hand side here, and actually the same set of test modes on the right-hand side. So we're comparing the same mode set with itself. Along this diagonal here, Pete, I'm comparing each mode to itself. So this is comparing mode one to mode one, mode two to mode two, mode three to mode three, and so on. Well, what do you think the MAC value of a mode compared with itself should be? I'm gonna guess one. One exactly. You'd expect if you compare something to itself, it'll be exactly the same. So that's what we see along here. So when we compute a MAC 
from a, a set of test modes, we always expect this diagonal value to be a value of 1. In this MAC matrix here, we can see that we've got some of these off diagonal values that are, are pretty high. We've got this you know, nice red one here. It's probably got a MAC value of something like 0 0.9 or 90% similar. And that's unexpected. We would expect for, if we were to compare, for example, this like uh, looks like in this diagram, we're comparing mode 9 to mode 4 for those mode shapes to be completely unique. Okay. And then so something uh, fishy is going on here, Pete, and let's examine what that might be. All right. So let's look at an example that we were, you know, just previously looking at. Here we're looking at that flat plate that Pete was showing, but we've got a couple more uh, measurement points. On the left-hand side, we're looking at mode 1 of this plate. On the right-hand side, we're also looking at mode 1, so we're comparing mode 1 to mode 1. And Pete, if uh, if you had a guess, what would you guess the MAC value of these two plates would be? 1 or 100%, because those mode shapes look identical to me. Yep, exactly. So now, on the left-hand side, we're comparing mode 2 with mode 1. And if we were to perform our MAC calculation, what do you think the MAC value would be? Well, they're pretty unique, but there might be one or two points moving the same, so pretty low, close to zero, I'm guessing. Yeah, exactly. It's not exactly zero, but it's a very low value, so these modes have a MAC value of 1.5%. Now, if we were to look at these two modes, so on the left-hand side, I've got a mode at 764 hertz, and on the right-hand side, I've got a mode at 385 hertz. Two different frequencies. You should have a unique mode shape, because different frequencies are kind of like snowflakes. Their mode shapes are unique, or snow shapes <laughs> but yeah those look yeah exactly look almost the same nick so yeah yeah and we we look at our mac value the mac value is 96 percent so you know we've got a we've got a, a pickle here pete what's going on no but let's uh let's take a look if we were to add a few more points to these plates so this is a six point plate and previously we were looking at a 15 point plate. So if I add some more measurement points to this plate and I look at the same mode shapes, uh, I'm looking at uh, the 764 hertz mode on the left and the 385 hertz mode on the right, and all of a sudden, look at my MAC value. Pete. Yeah, they look very different. So why were they yeah. so much the same when we had six points? So, let's take a look at a couple of these points. Do you see all these nice measurement points that we now have along the center of each plate? Yeah. So the one on the right is, you know, kind of acting like a hinge. All of these, uh, you know, the left and the right hand portion of this plate is out of phase with the middle yeah. of this plate. And on the right hand side, we have, or excuse me, the left hand side, we have a bit of a more complex bending shape. Yeah. And if we, I mean, I guess, you know, Pete, would you say that, you know, these points, if I were to look at maybe uh, this point here and, and maybe this point here, that actually might be a, a bad example. It looks like these ones are, are they moving in phase? I, I want this middle point here and that other middle point. They're not really moving together, are they? Well, the point in the very center does look like it's moving together. Am I being tricked by a, an optical illusion? Or I can't follow your laser in real time or something. <laughs> but uh, Well, anywho, if we were to go back to this previous plate, we haven't captured any of those points along the center of the uh, plate, so we're not able to distinguish the differences in the... Um, shapes at these two frequencies. Yeah, the one on the right, you don't have any of that bending along the center. 
So no. so it looks rigid as a result, even though it isn't. And I guess those measurements, though, those six points were correct. It's just that we didn't measure elsewhere to fully capture the shape. Yep, exactly. If we were to, you know, try and keep our eye on, you know, this left-hand corner of the plate, just as an example, if I advance the slide one more time, the left-hand corner of the plate is doing the exact same thing as it was doing before. So, you know, nothing has changed there. What's changed is we now have this point next to that point showing the uh, uh, the more complex bending of the plate. Yeah, we have more gradients sense. along the length, I guess. Or Exactly. Yeah. And so this phenomena, Pete, is sometimes called spatial aliasing because we don't have enough measurement data to completely describe the motion of the plate at that frequency. All right, should I try that on that six-point model we have? Yeah, let's uh, let's take a look at that inside Tesla. All right. All right, so I think the trick here is, you know, we don't need to do this basic animation anymore. I know that there's a product called Modal Analysis, and that has this Mac in it. So I'm going to turn on uh, the modal. And that adds a few more tabs along the bottom here. And I'm going to go to this modal validation. And uh, here we have our, our modes from the six point modal. So I'll calculate the Mac. It doesn't look quite as fancy as that graph you were showing. Let me. Oh, that's fancy. Okay, look at that. Yeah, so along one axis we have. Well, there's seven modes, so we have the seven modes here, same seven modes there. I guess mode one compared to mode one, 135 hertz, 100% alike. So as you said along the diagonal, when you compare a mode to itself, it's 100% the same. So that's making sense so far. Uh, if I compare mode one to mode two, I guess those shapes do look different, like you indicated, Nick. So Mac is pretty low in mode three to mode one, but this is that weird thing, off diagonal Macs that look the same. And yeah, here we have two modes that look like a rigid body, probably not enough points. Now, I also have that 15 point modal that you described. Should I do the same thing there? Yeah, let's take a look. All right. Hopefully our, uh, our Mac results get a little nicer with the addition of some more points. So in this case, we have 15 points. So yeah, like there, we can see along the diagonal, the, the modes uh, working. I'll go to validation here, and uh, I'll calculate the new Mac. Ooh, look at that. Did you see that change? Yeah, so we don't see it those especially those two it was like the 760 hertz mode yeah. and the 340 hertz mode the off diagonal has been obliterated because now we have enough points to see the difference in the shapes sweet so yeah i really i really like that nick um i guess if i'm doing a modal and i don't know if i've captured the shapes fully enough i can do a mac at some point and see if i need to take more points is that how i should Think about this. Or yeah, one way to think exactly. I think it's a, a good way to, um, I'll use the word validate, that you have performed a, a you know, a good modal test. So at least that um, you're capturing the mode shapes uniquely. Yeah, now if I go back here, I did think it was a little odd. We were looking at these mode shapes and... Uh, we had like torsion uh, way up high in frequency, right? Which now we know is probably like the bending way up high, the torsion way up high. There just wasn't enough points. But I, I thought this was, I didn't see a bending low. And this is a little asymmetric. It's like a combination bending and torsion. Like, I guess you might call that borsion. Okay. Um, I guess I'm suspicious. Why didn't we have like a first bending, first torsion in this mode set? Do you have some keen insight you can provide there? 
Yeah, well, let's let's take a look, and I think it would be helpful to first discuss the uh, the modal curve fitting process. Okay, you're gonna share. So the way we're actually going and and calculating these modes in the software. The mode shapes specifically. Exactly. Or I guess the, the modes mode too. Yeah. Okay. The mode shapes, the natural frequencies, and the dampings. All right. I'm ready. All right. So we do something called modal curve fitting. And in some of the examples we've shown before, we've done something called peak picking, or sometimes it's called single degree of freedom peak picking. So Pete, if you remember earlier, we were taking a look at this plate on the right, the actually the six point plate. And to calculate the mode shape of the plate, we were looking at the imaginary portion of the frequency response function. Yeah, it contained both the phase and the amplitude. Exactly. So, yeah, we could look at that imaginary portion and just considering that, you know, single frequency response function here, we know that there's a natural frequency here. We could plot the amplitude and the direction of that imaginary component and calculate the mode shape. So we call this peak picking because we're just looking at the peak and the direction of the imaginary portion of the FRF. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So that works really well when we have a structure with high modal separation. Hmm. So if I had a frequency response function that looks like this, notice how none of the peaks here are influencing the surrounding peaks. So below I've got a diagram where I'm showing um, I guess the influence of each mode on the frequency response function and they're not interacting very much together. We would say there's not a lot of influence from the surrounding modes. Okay. So in a, in a situation like that single degree of freedom peak picking is a suitable way for calculating the modes because if we only you know look at this peak for example we know we're only looking at that particular mode okay but what about a scenario pete where we have a lot of modes that are clustered yeah they're close together so they could influence so that imaginary portion of the frf may not be due to just one mode it could i guess for lack of a better word be contaminated by the surrounding modes they say yeah exactly large influence i say contaminated <laughs> it's more exciting that way it sounds like a, a disaster movie um but for structures that have low modal separation or have a lot of modes clustered together, we need a different strategy for determining the natural frequencies, the damping, and the mode shapes. And we do something called uh, multi-degree of freedom curve fitting. Ooh, sounds exciting. Where we analyze all of the frequency response functions at once, and we do some math and we're able to extract the modal parameters for the frequency response functions. So let's uh, take a brief look at this. The way that this curve fitting generally works is we are trying to fit a curve to our frequency response function data. And if we know the equation of this curve, we can extract things like the frequencies, the dampings, and the mode shapes from that curve. Is that Makes some sense so far, Pete? Yeah, except we don't know the curve of the data or the equation. So what does the computer do? Does it have to, like, guess? Yeah, so the computer is, you know, making some educated guesses and some iterations to try and find the curve that best approximates my frequency response function data. And the way these iterations work is it will assume a shape of a curve. Maybe here the, uh, the software says, let's assume that there's maybe one mode in my frequency response function, and we try and fit a curve to our data. Like a least squares fit yeah. with one degree of freedom or something. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And if, 
if we were to look at this, does this look like no. we have uh, done a very good job of capturing the dynamics of our FRF? No, I'd say one's a bad assumption. You better assume more. Yeah, so the software will then say, let's see what happens if we assume two modes. Because it doesn't know so, how many modes, so it just runs through, assuming... if it can calculate the modes of the system. All right. Well, I'm curious about the next slide. So, he, he, it's your response function data. Yeah, and maybe it even gets better as we go up, but we have to ignore some of the results or something. How does that, how does that work? So, that's a good point. You know, you might say, why wouldn't we just continue to increase the, the order of our curve fit in order to get better results? And we can kind of take a look at this here um, by, by looking at some curve fits of a set of data we have and what happens as we increase the order of the curve fit on that data. Oh, yeah, there's a little bit of noise on that data, so that might mess up the fit if we go too high. Yeah, it's so starting, you know, with the second order curve fit, the third order curve fit looks pretty good. And as we increase the curve fit, we maybe see small improvements. Oh, well, there might be improvements, if we, yeah. If we go too high, you see once we get to a tenth order curve fit, by trying to fit all of the noise in the data, um, we end up with a, with a worse result. Hmm. So there's a little bit of a balancing act. We want to find the correct order curve fit, but we don't want to just choose the highest curve fit order possible because we might be trying to fit a curve to noise in our data. Okay. So the way that we do this, Pete, or the way that the software tries to help you choose um, the order of the curve fit is through something called a stabilization diagram. Hmm. Colorful. It is. On the on the right hand side here, we can see we've got something called the model order. And this is the degree of curve fit that we are fitting to our frequency response function data. So functionally what we're doing is we assume that there's one mode and try and solve for the modes of our system. And then we increase the order and we do that again in an iterative process. When we get to a, uh, a point where the software thinks it has identified a mode of the structure, an O appears. Oh, some sort of so letter o, or an O. Okay. It, yep, indicates the, uh, that the software thinks it has identified a mode. They have a certain frequency and damping associated with that. Yep, okay. exactly. We then increase the order of the curve fit, and what we hope happens is that the frequency, damping, and mode shape stay consistent from curve fit order to curve fit order. So as we increase the um, model order, we hope that those uh, modal parameters are staying the same. Okay. Uh, and F indicates that the frequency has stayed the same, but that the damping and the um, mode shape may still be changing. D means the damping and the frequency are consistent. And S means everything is stable as we increase the model order. Oh. So what we want to see is a long column of S's. Okay. This indicates that this peak is a likely mode of our structure. So, Nick, that sounds great. But what what could it happen that you have, like, even two modes at the same frequency? Does, how does this thing work in that case? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question, and that brings us back to originally you were confused about that Borgian mode Yeah. in the software, right? Well, for symmetric structures, it's not uncommon for there to be two modes at the same frequency or very close to the same frequency, called a repeated root. Hmm. And so if we're not careful... 
that repeated root could appear like a single column of S's in the software because they're at the same frequency. But we've got some tools, Pete, to deal with that. Okay. One of those tools being the mode indicator function, which it sounds like a useful function, huh? The mode indicator Should function indicate is probably going to help modes, us yeah. identify where there's a mode and where there isn't. So. Uh, the mode indicator function is a, a tool that we can use, and it dips when it looks like there's a mode in the um, at that particular frequency. Oh. So if we were to look at this blue function here, this blue mode indicator function dips at this mode, it dips at this mode, it dips at this mode, and so on. That's your primary mode indicator function. And it, it dips. It does the opposite of the FRF that has peaks where there's a mode. The uh, the MIF is a dipper. Okay. Yes, the MIF is a dipper. Now, we also have a second mode indicator function here, Pete. Okay. And this second mode indicator function also dips oh. at this first um, peak in our frequency response function, but it doesn't dip at any of the other peaks in the FRF. And this second mode <clears throat> indicator function indicates the presence of a repeated root oh. at this frequency. So it's telling us that there are two modes at this same frequency here. Wow. Neat. Yeah. And to use this mode indicator function, Peter, the second mode indicator function, um, we need multiple references for our modal analysis. We'll get as many so to get refer uh, MIFs or, you know, primary, secondary means we had two references, primary, secondary, tertiary means we had three type thing. Exactly. Yeah, we get one MIF per reference Okay. on our structure. Hey, Nick. So you're saying a double dip is a good thing here. I'm saying it's in, two modes. In this case, only only in this case is a double dip appropriate. Have you seen the uh, TV series Seinfeld? I have seen some Seinfeld. Did TV. you see the double dip episode? Once upon a time, I have. Yeah. Although it's been a I while. I think double dip carries some negative connotations. You know, like you don't want to put your chip back in. Uh, into the dip but uh in this case double dip is okay we at least know that there's two modes there so should i give a shot in the software at looking at this yeah let's take a look all right i'll try this on the 15 point modal i'll go to the curve fitter here and i have my MIF calculation on oh and uh i guess under advanced here you can say like show me depending on here I have two references, so I can I could look at one mode indicator function, or I could look at the second, and indeed I got a double dip. Mm -hmm. Exciting. And it looks like there's only a double dip at that single frequency. Huh? Right. This isn't a double dip because it's at a crossover. Is that even though mm -hmm. it comes okay. Doesn't mean much. Stabilization diagram. I got this cranked up. It's gonna try and look for 32 modes at the top here and then at some point it looked for 31 then 30 29 etc and i can see some columns of s's nick so that each one yeah. of these corresponds to an estimate they're all very close or stable so 304 hertz 2.79 percent and i can pick up these uh doesn't matter which one i pick because they're about the same is that true it's, I'd say Pete is, uh, you know, true for the most part. But again, remember that example we had where when the model order is too high, Might. we start curve fitting some noise to our data. Okay. If I can see where this... But here, I think you're okay. Yeah, I can see where this originated because this O here was the first time it saw something and then it stabilized eventually. Same thing here. We had an O, Fs, and Ds, but it became Ss. So cool. And if I look at this first peak a little closer, wow, there are two columns of S's there. Maybe because there's two modes. 
So it's mathematically separated. Or let's see. Oh. I'll look at that first peak around 130. And wow, Nick, you're, well, there's torsion. I'll look at the next one. Bending. That's interesting because if I look at the FRF, it looks like a single peak. But in fact, mm -hmm. there's two modes there. They're just very, very close to each other, almost right on top of each other, huh? Yep. And if we if we tried to, to use that peak picking method, we wouldn't be able to separate those modes. Yeah, so we had to do this. We would get our Borgian mode. Multiple degree of freedom. Cool. Well, now I feel like I've really gotten a great uh, curve fit. You know, we got a, a Mac that's got very low off diagonal terms. We did the multiple degree of freedom curve fit. We can also check things like this synthesis. This tells me for the effort, uh, for the modes that I've selected, how closely it matches the measured FRF. So using the modes we selected, it regenerates the measure, the FRF uh, as if it had been measured, or I don't know if that's the right word. It regenerates the FRF uh, based on the modal parameters. And if I missed one, I would see something like this, right? Where it doesn't match the peaks very well. Yeah, yeah, you can kind of clearly see it looks like you maybe didn't select a mode in your stabilization diagram at those two frequencies. Yeah. And there's this correlation, tells me how close the shapes match, and the error tells me the amplitude difference. If I put those modes back in, Oh, the correlation gets close to 100. That's good. It means it's shapes matching well, and the error is closer to zero. So that's really good. Cool. And then once we think we have some good mode shapes, I, I guess we're maybe ready to go on and use this data to, you know, uh, make our structure, you know, change the natural frequencies so it doesn't blow apart based on the shapes and things like that, <laughs> like we saw at the beginning of our session here. Uh, yep. Did you want to, you have any conclusions you want to share, Nick? I'll have maybe one final uh, shout out here if I go back to my slides. I'd like to just have a, you know, or give a brief shout out to the, um, Siemens community website. Uh, Pete, have you used the Siemens community before? Yeah. You, know, um, you remember so, how I like take pictures of resonances as I drive around in the winter? I also yeah. uh, look at these uh, community articles you know, in yeah. my spare time. So, I can learn, learn a bit. The, the Siemens community site has a number of free um, articles uh, for anyone to read. Um, that go over a lot of the, you know, a lot of uh, the topics that we discussed here today. So, for example, there's an article on natural frequency and resonance, what are frequency response functions, getting started with modal curve fitting, uh, basically as, uh, you know, a resource for those who want to uh, understand a little more of the theory of structural dynamics, and also how-to guides on using uh, the SimCenter test lab software. Cool. Thank you, Nick. So with that, thank you, everyone. Yeah. We greatly appreciate you attending this session, and we hope to see many of you in the, the later session on modal correlation. Yep. I hope to see you guys then. Thanks.